Welcome to the Catholic View for Women, bringing you news and views from a truly Catholic perspective. I'm Teresa Tamio, co-host of this very fine program. And ladies, it's season number four already. Of course, if you're familiar with our program, you know our co-host, Janet Marana from Priests for Life and Silent No More, and also Astrid Bennett Gutierrez, president of Hispanics for Life in season four already, ladies. I can't Incredible. believe it. I feel very Exciting. blessed uh, that we are getting such a great response. You know, they go to our website, uh, thecatholicfewomen.com. We get those emails. And actually, uh, the material we're going to cover on this season is all based on viewer response. The questions that our viewers were still grappling with. And that's what we based our interviews on and our material for this season. There's so much to talk about, and we're starting out this season talking about, of course, two brand new saints. And what's right. so interesting about St. John Paul II and St. John the Twenty Third is that it's unusual. I mean, we have Gianna Beretamola, who was more recent, but it's unusual <coughs> for so many people to be familiar and maybe having been in an audience or right. actually having interviewed him as well uh, and met him, obviously. We talked to Joan Lewis in just a few minutes. but. These are real life saints. In our time. In our time. That's right. It's amazing. And you know, Teresa, we're very blessed to have on the set with us uh, a relic uh, of uh, John Paul II. And uh, a priest for life, you know, Father Pavone and I feel really blessed because uh, after his, uh, the Holy Father's canonization, we said we were going to dedicate priests for life uh, under his protection. And so Cardinal Jeebus was coming to the United States and we were put in contact with him. And we did an interview, which we'll see on one of our future programs, but uh, he gave us this relic. And, and this is actually a piece of uh, John Paul II's vestments, but what happened was the night he died, they of course you know, saved his blood, and this vestment, this piece of the vestment was then soaked in his blood. So this is considered a first class relic, and I want to thank Father Frank for our blessing us, director. our yep. spiritual mm -hmm. director, blessing us, and, and we'll have this here on our set uh, for all our programs, so we'll feel like uh, John Paul II, who was like a media pope, right. media will pope, be yep. blessing yep. us, and, and you know, we'll have him with us. And you know, Teresa, I want to remind everyone, too, uh, the great coverage. You were there for the canonization mm -hmm. of both these Holy mm -hmm. Fathers, and the National Catholic Register, um, <clears throat> between the coverage on EWTN Live and the Register, they did such a great coverage. Um, you know, of the canonization. I couldn't be there. You were fortunate to be there, but I felt like, you know, it was the next best thing to being there. Did you catch any of it, Astrid? On I the sure did. It, and on EWTN. Mm -hmm. It was amazing because I, I had the fortune of seeing John Paul II in uh, Toronto World Youth Day. So seeing him live was incredible, but then knowing that he was in heaven, I mean, interceding for us and all he'd done for us already in heaven, he would do so much more mm -hmm. for us in the pro-life movement, in the church. It was exciting. It was exciting to be there, to see the number of people. And it, was, uh, it wasn't as crowded as they expected. It was really busy, but it wasn't as, as bad as most people thought it would be. I think some of the estimates of, of the secular media kept some people away, but there were an additional one million people in Rome, many of whom, of course, were from Poland. And it was so neat to see the pride of the Polish people right. because it really lifted them up. And then there were many people who had the great memories of, of John the 23rd. So we're going to um, look at that today. But before we go on, I want to remind folks that to go to our website, Catholic View for Women, and our Facebook page. But we always have our, our wonderful, wonderful our, our <coughs> patroness, patroness of, the series. of the series. It's called uh, the Madonna of the Kitchen, and she's available at the EWTN Religious Catalog. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Astrid always she points has out. Some symbols here. Um, the broom, mm -hmm. it uh, signifies cleanliness of the home, but also purity. And uh, the pot here is a symbol of nourishment, for nourishment of um, the heart, I'm sorry, of the body soul, soul, body and soul, and then the keys um, to keep the home safe mm -hmm. as well. That's right. mm -hmm. And she's with us um, every year. That's right. And we all know that we keep the her in our kitchens. And I have to say, the conversation <laughs> in my kitchen stays a lot cleaner when guests come in and see our lady there, shining uh, example. Like Mother Angelica always says, you have to keep those holy reminders that's right around. Mm -hmm. And that's become so popular. You gave me uh, the Madonna of the Kitchen, which I have, as you know, in my right. kitchen on my windowsill above my sink. And when my mother-in-law was in two years ago for my husband's ordination to the diaconate, she saw that and she said, where did you get that? And I said, from my friend and we can order it from EW. Chan, so I ordered two. I ordered, remember at the, at the right. family celebration, I yeah. ordered that one for my mother-in-law and one for my sister-in-law, Lisa. So now they have it in their homes as and, well. And 
one of the girls in our office uh, was just married, and we gave her one at her bridal shower from Father Pavot, and then he blessed it. And so, like, now for her kitchen, there's a new bride, and she's going to have it. So it, it, it is beautiful, but it also keeps people, right. their conversation on, on point. You know, we always have family who's been away from the church, and they're around our house, especially at the holidays, and the conversation can get off case. So it's a good reminder. And I also think, too, as Catholics, we, we have such a gift in our faith that it really embraces everything that we are in terms right. of not just our spiritual being, because we're not just souls, you know, floating around somewhere. We are... And the incarnation, of course, makes the body so beautiful and so wonderful. And so we have these images, uh, of, and this reminder is the relic of, of St. John Paul II, this image of Our Lady, because it just helps us stay in touch with who we are spiritually and physically right. as well. Well, and you know, these two popes, like all three of us, John Paul II, we kind of live with him, right. so to speak. But Well, we all know, grew up with him. We grew up, but John the Twenty Third. I was thinking back, you know, I was born in 52, so when he became pope i was like eight years old or something and when right. he passed away i was 11. and i have just a fuzzy memory of him not not real clear uh and you know recently of course uh, i was visiting in rome with joan lewis who was the bureau rome bureau chief for mm -hmm. ewtn and we'll listen to her interview shortly and she'll talk about um you know what it was like for her as a college girl you know to go uh, to his audience. So she I think got very close to him too, as, she as she'll describe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I think is, is so great is to learn about them and their personalities. And one thing that I love about John the 23rd is that he was he had quite a sense of humor. I, obviously, right. I, I was born in 59 a few years after you, so I have a, I don't have a, too much of a memory at all of John the 23rd, except from what my mom and dad used to always tell me about him. But I remember reading one line that he said when he was talking about at some point everybody has to rest and you wonder about the responsibility right. of the popes and what's on their shoulders and i remember reading a great quote he said lord it's your church i'm tired i'm going to bed so in other <laughs> words even the pope right has to take right. a break and has to rest physically a reminder that jesus took time out to pray so yeah. practical yeah mm -hmm. and you know yeah. we're going to talk about it later in our homework but i what i think is great is that he wrote this yep. uh, Autobiography. I got my copy too. Yeah. And, and you know what's amazing is, you know, nowadays when we write books, as Teresa and I have done, you do it on a computer. But right. but he did this all by hand. I mean, it's it's a beautiful book, and he has uh, prayers and devotions in here. Mm -hmm. I mean. I, when I got a hold and of that, this is supposed to be. I haven't. I've just started reading it, and my friend Al Cresta at Ave Maria Radio, my colleague, was telling me that this really had a difference, made a difference in his life in terms of really having a deeper understanding of, of the Catholic faith right. when he first came back to the church. So we'll, we're going to have this as part, on of, our our website, part of our homework. Because for people who you know didn't have any right. contact with this great mm -hmm. saint, uh, this is you read this, and you're going to feel like you know him. Because mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. We don't feel we know John the Twenty Third, and I think the whole canonization. If you could give a different perspective maybe sure. Teresa but I think the fo more of our focus was on John Paul and you want to say well come on don't forget John and I always remember when I went to Rome <laughs> it was terrible I used to see John the 23rd there in, in you know laying in corrupt and, and everything and I would say why are they going to make him a saint? What's taking so long? And then bingo, Pope he Francis is. does it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he well, must have heard me. Well, speaking of John the 23rd, as you said, you caught up with our EWTN bureau chief for EWTN in Rome, Joan Lewis, and she describes for us, as Janet interviewed her in her beautiful apartment right across from the Vatican, her thoughts looking back on the first time she was really up close and personal with now St. John the 23rd. Let's take a listen and a look at what Joan Lewis has to say. What can I say about the canonization, especially when you have someone, you have St. John, St. Pope John the 23rd, and I have been in his presence as a living human being, as a pope. So to be at the canonization of a person, should we say you knew, is very, very extraordinary. And I guess at this point it would behoove me to go back in time to March of 1961, folks. I was a junior in college, studying in Switzerland. Our group came to Rome. We were here, I looked up the date the other day, March 19th to 20, uh, the 24th. And we had an audience scheduled with this Pope John the 23rd. And it was very exciting. We're, we're all Catholics. We were at a Catholic university, grown up in the church our entire life. And we were now gonna be in the presence of a Pope. And we went to, it was very interesting because there's no audience hall like there is today. The uh, Paul VI audience hall or of course St. Peter's Square for Pope Francis. But 
the then, in 1961, where popes, when they received groups, where they received them was in the atrium, above the atrium of St. Peter's Basilica. There's a big hall called the Hall of Blessings. It probably, I, I don't think I thought of people at the time, but maybe one or 2,000 people can fit into the hall. This is the hall that's behind the main balcony of St. Peter's Square, which everybody associates with papal elections and so forth. And then there's two more balconies on either side of that main balcony. So behind all those windows is this hall. And it was so exciting to come into the room on one side, it's all windows, and I was on the side that was just wall. And I could see the sunlight streaming in and I thought, oh no, I'm not gonna get a picture with all that light, the backlight. But the Pope was carried in on a chair, the last one to use it. He was carried in on the chair by the sediari, the chair bearers. But people preceded him and as they did so on the windows, they pulled the drapes shut. So the light in the room was perfect. And I have, to this day, framed on a table in my home, I have the picture that I took of, of John the 23rd. And to be in his presence, you know, I, I went on the internet because we didn't get a copy of his, of his talk at the time. And I went on the internet to see what talk he would have given in that March week of 1961. And it seems that there were not weekly general audiences at the time. Popes just received people on specific dates, but not a every Wednesday at this hour. So, so that was very, very exciting. But what's even more exciting for me when I think of, of St. John uh, the 23rd is after his beatification, his body, which had been in the grottoes of St. Peter's Basilica, his body was moved upstairs where I, I'm guessing most of our viewers would have seen it on their trip to the Vatican. That was moved in, I think it was June uh, of 2001. He was beatified in um, September of 2000. Anyway, when his body was brought up, one day, it was an audience Wednesday, I was working for the Vatican, and um, I was asked if I wanted to join a very select group of 15 people who were gonna get to see for the first time up close and personal, the, the new casket, if you will, of John the 23rd. Well, this was an audience Wednesday. Normally the basilica is closed when there's an audience in St. Peter's Square. So it was this great honor. And we were brought into the basilica because we knew that his body, when they opened the casket to beatify him, they discovered that his body was intact which is like amazing. So now we're going to the Basilica, we're seeing him in this new glass casket. And what the gentleman told us, I hadn't read anywhere, this is a, a historian in St. Peter's Basilica. And he said, if you look at the body of the Pope, he looks like, he, he died when he was in his 80s, but he looks like he's 60. The thing being, when he died, because you have no more muscles and, and, and no more fat or anything else, he was kind of a roly-poly man. And you don't have any more of that. So his body looked a lot younger, and they did change his vestments. They took off the old vestments. When they took off gloves, his hands were covered with gloves. So his hands were, had darkened when they were exposed to the air. And they covered the hands and then his face with wax to make him look apparently a little more lifelike the color. And they told us that the, um, I'm not sure what metal it is, but there are small pieces of metal that are on the glass casket on the front and they're curved. And this is a, supposed to be symbolic of Pope John's love of children and his constantly telling parents to give their children a caress at night when they send them to bed and to tell them that this is from the Pope. So just those are my two personal experiences with a man who's, who's now a saint, but I mean, you could talk forever about John the 23rd and the amazing similarities between John the 23rd and Pope Francis. Their love of people, their love of being casual, John the 23rd was known to leave the Vatican at night just dressed as a priest and they say the same that Pope Francis does the same thing to go out and and feed the poor 
And one of the things I loved about John the 23rd was because of his going out and just wanting to walk and wander around in Rome neighborhoods, he was known as Johnny Walker. So that when that etiquette was, that tag was, was put on him, a lot of, of people were amused. But here's a man who was so down to earth. And what I love about thinking of a pope who was so down to earth, who could have been my grandfather, that's how I thought of him when I saw him. It's that he's so human, he's so like us. You know what? That gives me, that gives us a good chance to think of, of becoming saintly. That's great insights from our very own Joan Lewis, Joan Lewis, EWTN Rome Bureau Chief. When we come back, more about the brand new saints, St. Saint John Paul II and John the 23rd, of course, plus what's coming up on season four of The View. I think you're going to like it because it's all about you, what you wanted to see and hear on this program. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the first show of season four of the Catholic View for Women. I'm Teresa Tamio, along with my co-hosts, of course, Janet Marana and Astra Bennett Gutierrez. In this first program, we're talking about the new saints, St. Saint John Paul II and St. John the 23rd. And Astrid, you wanted to mention something about a cute little anecdote about uh, John the 23rd? Yes. Part of my reversion story is that I read a lot. And one of the books that I recall especially was a book about... Uh, St. John 23rd now. Um, anecdotes. It's kind of weird to say that though, isn't it? Yeah, St. John the 23rd, St. John Paul II. Yeah. Yeah. What, what an amazing reason to rejoice. Well, this, this book had one particular anecdote that I really, um, it really struck me because he was so tender, uh, but he spoke the truth in, uh, in love. So he always uh, was ready to tell people when there was some sort of uh, spiritual peril. And this uh, particular anecdote, he was going to visit a, a village in Italy. So in preparation for this visit uh, from the Pope, the people covered up these billboards that they felt were indecent mm -hmm. or the women were immodestly dressed and the Pope caught on to that and when he arrived he told them you know don't worry about me I'm an old man worry about your young people your children ah. so he really was not afraid to tell people and he did, did it with so much love so and this particular anecdote for me it just really talks about um, the importance of purity and, and modesty. And this, this season, we're going to have many topics having to do with the issue of sexuality, which is such an important issue uh, uh, today. And uh, we're going to bring out a lot of topics that are very difficult to discuss, yeah. but very important. But based on really what our viewers wanted to see and to hear, and, and one of the big issues, and we see it all over the news, I don't think a day goes by where we don't see someone or some entity or organization or Hollywood star pushing this agenda uh, of right. to redefine marriage exactly. as God ordained it between one man and one woman. It's all over the place. And how do you deal with it in your family? This is a question that came up. Even if you don't have someone in your family that may be struggling with the same sex attraction, we know of a lot of quote unquote Catholics yeah. who support the idea of the redefinition of marriage. Mm -hmm. And so this is an opportunity to really um, catechize. And mm -hmm. so we're going to be doing that with three episodes. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, I was thinking too about these two saints. When you think about St. John Paul, look where his name came from. He took John after St. John the 23rd. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, in October of 2014, uh, Pope Francis will beatify him. And that's where the Paul, so it's John Paul. And, and then of course, himself, you know, he takes that name. And so now, do we think about that? There's th three saints papal saints, you know, in our times. I mean, that's quite extraordinary. But I think about, uh, you know, for John Paul, for my, my uh, own recollection for him is that in 1995, when Evangelium Vitae was announced, you know, being active already with Father Pavone mm -hmm. in the pro-life movement, for me, it was a, such a blessing for, for myself, I think, for our ministry at Priest for Life, but for so many people I know in the pro-life movement, and I think you would agree, Esther, because you also mm -hmm. work in the pro-life movement, it was like giving like almost like an amen to our hard work and giving us a blueprint for our work because in that encyclical, he really covered uh, the whole spectrum of life issues and giving us our marching orders. And I think it gave us even more courage to do our work, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's so full of um, hope and, and truth and um, even just the chapter that strikes me the most is the one where he talks about healing, mm -hmm. you know, and um, we're going to cover actually this season a topic about healing, you know, healing the wounds of the sexual revolution. Right. And in there, he talks about the post-abortive people, but um, the culture 
of death has wrought many different kinds of right. victims. Post-abortion is, mm -hmm. is one major mm -hmm. issue, but also so many um, women and men who are lost and, as you said, mm -hmm. caught up in that, that uh, you know, over-sexualized culture of ours. But there's a number of other topics that we're going to be talking about, including in our next episode, we're going to take a look at the elderly, which I think right. is very important, especially the wisdom of elderly women. I'm blessed. My mother just turned um, 88 years old earlier this year. And of course, Janet, you've met uh, my aunts. My Aunt Jenny, my godmother, is 92. And my Aunt Mary just turned 90. And these women have had a big influence on my life. And I think right. sometimes, again, just as with this agenda to, to push um, you know, perversions of marriage and, and relationships, you have this push to not respect life, not mm -hmm. only uh, at conception, of course, and, and the unborn child in the womb, but um, you know, we say from womb to tomb, from conception to natural death, that's not how the world sees it. And there's right. a bigger push, especially in Europe. There was an article that came out earlier this year that was just stunning to me, and I had it posted on my Facebook page, about even if the elderly, in particular countries over in Europe, aren't sick, what's bad enough, if, mm -hmm. if they're trying to, to um, you know, take their life before their, um, their, their time, but now they're actually pushing this just because of their age. Let's mm -hmm. say if they're over 80, well, you don't need to live anymore, so making that kind of a decision. So we wanted to, to really remind people of the gifts that the elderly are. So that's another Absolutely. topic we're going to cover. Well, and also St. John Paul, too, that's what he taught us, too, is how to die with dignity. Absolutely. You know, it, it, I always remember at the very moment when the Holy Father was dying, Terry Shiva was being starved to death in this every same time. And here, the culture of death had their grips on Terry Shiva, where John Paul II was mm -hmm. showing us this is how you know, you die with dignity. Absolutely. And uh, it, it was such, really such a great example. And of course, he mentions that in, in the Evangelii Vitae uh, encyclical about, you know, how the proper way of treating uh, when it's our time to go. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like uh, we don't have control over our death. You know, that's when the Lord calls us. And that's mm -hmm. what John Paul II taught us, that, mm -hmm. you know, he suffered for years with Parkinson, but yet, as he said, life is always a good. Mm -hmm. and, and that phrase to me is so important because sometimes, you know, any one of us could, you know, you know, I have a, a relative or a friend who's very sick in the hospital and they're in critical condition and you're struggling with the condition they're in. You have to keep that phrase front and center in your mind. Mm -hmm. Life is always a good. Yes. And isn't it true, you know, both of you would say that nowadays life is being trampled upon. People are saying, oh, look at all the money that's being spent to keep this person alive. You know, why are we doing this? Because yes. life is always a good, and, you know? And John Paul II, he taught us the value of, of human life. He really brought that out, not only in the gospel of life, but also in his writings in Theology of the Body. And if viewers have not um, really gotten to know John Paul II, maybe the uh, newer generation, Generation Y, I really recommend a, a new book that uh, was just published uh, in Jason Evers. Yeah, right before the canonizations. Yeah. It's called St. John Paul the Great. And basically in this book, Jason brings out some new uh, anecdotes five related loves, to and, say, and yeah. the five mm -hmm. loves of John Paul, which were young people, human love, Eucharist, Our Lady, and the cross, which is what you were just talking about right now. And in particular, um, the section on human love, which talks about sexuality, chastity. He did so much for that um, teaching of the church in love and responsibility um, in his work in Theology of the Body. Right, right. He also talked a lot about, and, and this is an area, well, obviously he was known mm -hmm. as the media pope, so he is real significant for me, but he was the one who first gave us the phrase of new feminism. We need a That's new right. feminism. And that was actually the first time it was mentioned was Evangelium Vitae. Mm -hmm. Then it was built upon in Mulieris Dignitatum mm -hmm. in the Papal mm -hmm. Letter to Women, but there's, there's so much to this, well, to both yes. of these men, the John right. the 23rd and John Paul II. And this II. book is available through the religious catalog and people can get it and give it as a gift to young people, especially That's to right. discover this treasure that we have in St. John Paul II. Yeah. I think it's important, again, to stress that the, the shows that we have coming up are, are really based, Janet, and maybe you can remind our viewers, it's based on their requests, what they That's wanted right. to see. And so we, we go over <laughs> the Facebook comments and we go over the emails and we say, okay, what does Susie from Sarasota want to hear or, exactly. or Mary from yeah. Maine? And, and then we, we look and say, Oh, gosh. And we had a lot of people wanting to talk about um, the agenda that's out there. That's right. Well, in particular, you know, I think for women, too, they see, you know, our program of really showing the Catholic spin, so to speak, on what it means to be a woman within the church, practicing our faith. Uh, and but I don't know if you want to call it a spin because it's truth. No, it's truth, exactly. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the other right. view, right. which their is spin. their spin. <laughs> That's their spin. <laughs> That's right. their spin. Right. But, you know, and, and talking about John Paul II, I think you just mentioned Miliaris Dignitatum. I mean, that is one of my favorite encyclicals because very often the church is painted by the media to be so oppressive for women. And John Paul II's documents, Miliaris, and of course his letter to women, 
uh, to me, uh, we're, we're just shining beacons of showing the, the dignity of women. Uh, matter of fact, you know, from the Middle Earth Dignitatum, I really, can we have a minute? We only have about two minutes left, so we All have right, to get real to that quick. quickly and then the homework. All right, just this final phrase, it's at, um, it says right here, the present reflection now at the end, this is the end of the, of the encyclical, um, has sought to recognize within the gift of God what he, as creator and redeemer, entrusts to women, to every woman. In the spirit of Christ, in fact, women can discover the entire meaning of their femininity and thus be disposed to making a sincere gift of self to others, therefore finding themselves. See, right. gift of you self to others. You don't find yourself mm. until you lose yourself in Christ. That's right. That's one of his key themes. That's and right. that came up again, in, as you said, Amelia Aristide and mm -hmm. other letters. Okay, Janet, we have about homework a minute left. So go to the CatholicViewForWomen.com. All right. of this will be posted on our website and our Facebook page. But Go Starting ahead. with, of course, the autobiography of St. John the 23rd, Journey of a Soul, highly recommending that. And then, of course, reading the documents of John Paul II, starting with, I'm going to give you a long list, but it's on the website, and the links are there. Christi, Christi Fidelis Laice, Miliardis Dignitatum, Veritatis Splenda, Evangelium Vitae. Now, these, these encyclicals should be read. And the papal letter to women. And the papal yeah, letter to, to women. Yeah. They should be read in order because you'll see how the Holy Father built one upon the other. Upon right. the other. And, of course, on our website, we will have uh, all the links, all this information. You can download the documents. And we'll have also suggested questions for discussion. Because, you know, Teresa, I think it's so important that so many of our uh, viewers are re-watching these shows uh, in small discussion groups. And to have the resources. And then have yeah, the resources absolutely. to really unpack the teachings. Okay, we've got to wrap up. Thanks so much for watching. And we'll see you next time on the Catholic View for Women. Stay tuned.